fast as we can, as slow as we must. These are words that I just got from this incredible interview with Dr. Latanya Goffney. She's a superintendent in Aldine, Texas, incredible leader. And I honestly couldn't think of a better way to start the new season for a new year of the Innovator's Mindset podcast. And when she said this to me, fast as we can, as slow as we must, she really made me think about that impact that we have, you know, serving kids. We want to do everything that we can, but we've got to be really thoughtful in this process. And it's something that I, I, I think really resonated with me as I look into this new year, because we always want to get better. And sometimes we rush to stuff and then we don't maintain it or we rush to things and we don't do them really well. And it's not necessarily about doing things as quickly as possible, but actually doing the right things, you know, in, in a, in a speed that is always serving, you know, the people that we work with kind of doing this. And so, uh, I know I, there's not much I can say because this podcast is incredible. I really loved it. And it's just such a great way, um, to start off the third season. I'm, I'm so excited about this because, uh, I want to get better at this process. I want to get better at the, doing this podcast. And, um, I think one of the things that I can do is have, um, really incredible stories from educators like Dr. Goffney. And I know you're going to be inspired and I know it's just a great way to start the new year. So welcome back to season three of the Innovators Mindset podcast. Hey everyone, it's George Kuros. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset podcast. In fact, the very first episode of the innovators mindset for uh the 2022 see i don't even know what year it is anymore because i'm just like just a blur since 2020 right it's just like what so i am so pumped for this uh i have the incredible honor to have uh dr latonya Goffney from aldine in, in texas i'm gonna i'm gonna do a little shout out to aldine <laughs> for, for all your staff that's li- i wonder if you like your staff I don't know if you ever have this where you actually do something and you know a lot of them know about it, but they don't talk to you about it. It's like, because I used to blog and I know like my staff read it, but they never would mention it to me. It was like my dirty secret. <laughs> Listen, and all the, they're all in for all the, so anything all the, so our whole it. staff will know about it. They'll be I love it. I love it. <laughs> so we're, we're going to, we're going to get into it, but uh, Dr. Goffney here has basically won every award ever in education. <laughs> Like you have, like, it's, it's weird. I'm like, how many, like, save some and, uh, and just has an incredible career. Uh, I was mentioned in another podcast, um, tweeted, she was excited to see me and two other people speak at a conference. I'm like, okay, I don't know if she knows who I am, but I'm going to pretend and I'm so excited. So I DM would you to be on this podcast immediately. And, uh, it is, it's such a, I've, I've actually been watching your career. I've been watching, Um, you know, kind of like seeing stuff that you're doing, always kind of connected. And so I'm really excited to have you on the podcast just to kind of talk about education and, you know, what you're doing in Aldi and how you're doing. But like, how do you like, just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do today and how you got to that, that point. (laughs) Well, thank you, George. I'm really excited to to be here today and excited about you coming to Texas in January. It's going to be so exciting. Listen, really, I'm really excited for 2021 to be over and to welcome you in 2022. <laughs> so excited right. about that as well. But um, I am Latanya Goffney. I'm the proud superintendent of All Dean ISD. It's located in Houston, Texas. Uh, if you've ever flown into Bush Intercontinental Airport uh, in Houston, then you are in the middle of All Dean. We are 111 square miles of just excellence and opportunity, and we serve nearly 67,000 students. And uh, we're really excited about the different opportunities that we're providing for our students. And so uh, when you look at where I am now, um, you know, there's really nothing in my past that have predicted that I would be where I am because um, the reason why I'm passionate about it and the reason why I don't get excited about the awards is because this work uh, is is personal for me. Mm -hmm. Um, Education changed the trajectory of my life. Um, Growing up, I was, uh, my mom was, 15 when she had me and um, she didn't know who my father was and um, just lived a life of uh, lots of obstacles. I ended up moving in with my grandmother and that pretty much changed um, my personal experience 
in, even though we were still in poverty, my grandmother worked as a, a housekeeper for one of the local families. And my grandpa, he worked as, he took care of lawns and collected cans. And we were still poor, but I was super excited to be out of the abusive situation in which I lived with my mom. And the, the most important piece of that, though, is the fact that things were crazy at home. But at school, I was with teachers who believed in me, encouraged me, and inspired me to aspire to something better than what I was currently experiencing. So when I say education changed the trajectory of my life, mm -hmm. it did. And so to kind of speed up, I was uh, the first in my family to graduate from, from college, uh, to even attend college, but then to graduate. And just um, initially, I did not want to do education. And I, I hate right. that. That's the by reality. I didn't. I, I had been inspired by educators, but I thought that I wanted to be an attorney. I thought I wanted to be an accountant. And then uh, one day it just I couldn't ex escape that I was going to go and I was going to be an educator. And so I'm so glad that I did, because, again, it's a profession that um, has changed the whole trajectory of my life. Wasn't aspiring to be. Right, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> Or any of that either. <laughs> it's, funny, it's funny because like I, you know, I, I don't have that like that story about, you know, I basically wanted to go in education because I saw I'm not even kidding, saw Billy Madison. I'm like, that looks cool. So I'm gonna do that. And that was like basically, but I had no interest in state. I was like, I didn't like school. But then you look back at your your educators that have an impact on you. Mm -hmm. And then and also like, you know, my parents are both immigrants to Canada from Greece. They mm -hmm. they saw education as a way to, you know, to something better. Like my mom had a grade two, sex education. My dad had a grade two education. And they're like, we don't want this life for you. Right. Thank and so you. we want to create something. So like, I always knew the value of education. Um, and, and so it, it, it's kind of interesting to see, you know, um, some of those connections. Uh, when you, when you think about the, the notion of like changing trajectories, right. Mm -hmm. I, I've been thinking about this quite a bit. Um, it, it, I felt, I feel in some ways when, uh, when I went to, you know, school in what the 1980s, right. Mm -hmm. That like going to like college, you know, that was like a trajectory changer. And, and now I don't necessarily think it is the same because I think there's different opportunities. Like there's different door, op you know, openings, but I think that we're, sometimes so focused on kids going on to the same path that we did mm -hmm. as opposed to ensuring education is always a trajectory change, but like is actually, you know, but we see there's different opportunities now. So like, how do you, how do you like open that too? Because like, I, I always say like, I don't want kids, every kid to go to college. I want them to have that opportunity if they, if they so choose, but like, how do we, you know, how do we stay focused on that? Like that education is always, a way to change trajectory of our, the lives of the people we serve. No, I think you're absolutely right, because we both um, at the time it was, you know, I graduated in the 90s. And so hmm. college was the place to go if you want to change your trajectory. Yeah. And now my daughter's a senior. She will yeah. graduate uh -oh. in 2022. And she is not as focused on college yeah. as go. Uh, yes, but she's not as excited about the opportunity to go and she doesn't see it as a, a life changer or changing her tra trajectory. Mm -hmm. And so I agree with you. Our, many times our students have so many different uh, choices and opportunities and education looks differently. And so I think it's really important that we prepare students in K-12 for whatever choice that they have or whatever opportunity they have that they can walk to the, through the door with the skills necessary in order to be successful. And so I think that's hard for those of us who uh, saw college as the right. As the way out, I got. I got. You mentioned at the beginning of this. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. You said like, I just want 2020 to be over, but your daughter's also about to graduate. <laughs> Are you like, yeah, I want this part to go fast, but <laughs> this part to go slow. Are you having some of that? Like, it is a delicate balance. You know what's yeah. funny is my daughter when she went uh, into kindergarten in 2008 was my first year as a superintendent. So her really? whole life she has been a superintendent's child. Uh oh. And so. <laughs> I think that, uh, and she's always, I've always had her in whatever district in which I was serving. So she, I've, I've disrupted her school experience three times. And so <laughs> right. hopefully she forgives me and she listens to this someday and say, hey, my mom did the best she could. Right. But seriously though, she doesn't see education as that great equalizer that I say, I, I've always seen it as and that I experienced. So your point was definitely well taken. So it's so important that she's prepared for whatever door she wants to walk through. 
do, have you ever like how, can i ask you this because like you know, i have a daughter who's you know uh like just about turned six we have a, another daughter who's you know one and a half years old and like how do you how do you how do you like you know like when when do you go superintendent mode and when do you go parent mode like how, how do you how do you figure that out it has been very difficult. It's actually a conversation that my good friend Jill Siler and I have had because mm -hmm. both of our daughters are the same age. And so it's really hard. I'm kind of jealous of her because for her daughter's final years, she's not in the superintendent's role. Right. But it's so hard because you have a, a daughter who says, Mom, you right. always take right. the teacher's side. And then <laughs> I'm always cautious that the teachers don't think that I'm one of those parents who doesn't believe that their child, who thinks their child is perfect. So it is a delicate balance. And so right. for her senior year though, um, I think all the moms who are listening will be proud that I have really uh, focused on, you know, being present and active during her senior year and making sure that she knows that um, I'm, I'm her, her biggest fan and her biggest cheerleader and her biggest supporter. And um, uh -huh. unfortunately that hadn't always been a reality. She's been fending for herself because she's had, she always shows up at the, as a superintendent's daughter. You it's, it's, so uh, I'm listening to you cause we probably grew up around the same time just mm -hmm. because of the nineties reference. I'm figuring <laughs> out we're very close to around <laughs> the same uh, generation here. And it's interesting that you said, you know, I know my kid's not perfect. Mm -hmm. Right. And then sometimes it takes the teacher side and it was like kind of balanced mm -hmm. and, and like, honestly, <laughs> When I was a kid, it was like no matter what I did, I was the wrong one, and like oh. the teacher was a hundred percent right, right? Yeah. And like a newsflash for people who might not. You, this is gonna, I'm giving you a little warning here. Like we, I used to get smacked by my teachers all the time, and they would like call and say like, "Yeah, we had to like get George today," and they're like, "What did you do?" Like yeah. that, that, and I was like, "Well, that's a little insane. Like that's a little bit one side, right?" But no, they, you got swatted at school. Yeah, and our household. My grandmother, you got swatted at home. Right, you got, you got double. <laughs> you got right? double. Yeah. right, and so, but then, but now it's kind of like, and maybe I don't know. Maybe this is the context of where I'm at. It almost seems like it's totally shifted to the other, and that's one of the things that you know stresses a lot of people out in education is that you know it seems like the teacher's always wrong, and my like, and I I know that's you know that's like I don't want to generalize that it's all that. But it, it seemed like in when I grew up, it was always like it was more the teacher. You side with the teacher, and now it's like, is no, my kid would never do anything wrong, right? Like, have you seen that? Is that something that you have to deal with ever? Oh, definitely, definitely, and that's why in our district, uh, we try our best to to make sure that our teachers are connecting, inspiring, and having an impact. And so that connection begins not only with the student but also with yeah. the families. And so yeah. just imagine this: if every single teacher called every single parent at the beginning yep. of the school year and told them good news, told them how excited they were to welcome the students to the class or your student. Um, I know during COVID, just having my uh, child's teacher call and say, hey, right. I'm going to call and check on Jocelyn. Like I was practically in tears. You know, that was just a heavy moment anyway, the, the right. pandemic. But if you call and give good news, you call and establish a relationship, you call and share things before uh, there's a moment of escalation or something, then the parent is more apt to believe you because they already have a connection with you. Right. And so um, I think while that is a reality, uh, a lot of times the teacher is always wrong. I think there are some things that we can do to be more proactive and connect yeah. and build a relationship with our, with our parents. So I guarantee you somebody's, and this is the way I see this, what you just said, and I think it's so important. Somebody is listening to this and they're going, you know, that's a really great idea, but like, <laughs> I don't have time for this, right? Like I got all this stuff I'm getting ready, blah, blah, blah. And the way that I always see it is you can take the two minutes now no. mm -hmm. and it's going to save you literally hours later when you have to make a tough one, right? Or you could, you're, you know, and then it, like, it's always, I always see it as an investment, right? That's mm -hmm. an investment in their kids. It's mm -hmm. and plus like, not like I would rather have, uh, you know, a, a five minute tough phone call that I'm not as stressed out as because I built a relationship with the person right. and an hour long stressful. And then this might go to the superintendent and yeah. like all this <laughs> stuff, right. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, like just, mm -hmm. just like, I think that advice is so important, but like, mm -hmm for people listening it is it is totally an investment that you will get back oh, absolutely. right absolutely. And, may, and maybe you'll never maybe you'll never have a tough phone call mm -hmm. and, and all you did was make that parent feel good mm -hmm. 
right? Listen, <laughs> I'm telling you, it works because even uh, we, yeah. uh, it was an initiative of our school district and just to see, you know, social media, I'm pretty active on pretty much all of the platforms. And so to hear, to see parents who are post either a good newsletter or to, right. uh, make a post and say, oh my God, my, te- my, my child's teacher just called and told me that he was, he was good in class today. That just made my day because normally they're calling to tell me that he's not a good kid or telling me what he did wrong and so on and so forth. So it, parents, you know, I, uh, I had a, a superintendent a mentor who told me that parents are sending us the best that they have. It's not like they're keeping all the good kids at home. And, just, <laughs> right, <laughs> so, right. and so um, and they, everybody wants what's best for their kid. It's just yeah. many times they just don't have the tools in order to to advocate for them. And so it's so important that as teachers and, you know, teachers always rise to the occasion. And so. Uh, that's why we try to make sure that we build those relationships again, not just with our students, but also with our with our families. So one one thing, and thinking about like building relationships, mm-hmm. one of the things. So, I, like, I actually, it's so easy to talk to you, right? <laughs> and you're just, like such an easygoing person. <laughs> you are, but like, there is some like you are a superintendent. Mm-hmm. You, I've seen you've won awards, like you know, I, seriously. And so you kind of like you have this perception. And then, you know, and I, like, I kind of think about that too, is that even, you know, when I was a principal, when I first became a principal, mm-hmm. I was younger than probably about 80% of my staff. And then like, all of a sudden it was like, people were like, oh, they cared what I said about, cause I was the principal. Right. And it was like kind of mm-hmm. weird. Mm-hmm. And so like, one of the things that I, I saw, I've watched you do is how you connect with te- Like you, I know you connect with people all over the world, but I know you connect with people in your own district and mm-hmm. you are like such a voice for that. And like, does that help with your, I don't know, maybe visibility with your staff like that you actually, cause you have a huge school district, but you, but you use it uh, like, uh, it's almost like you make it smaller through the use of social media. Have you like, is that intentional? Like how do you oh. go through the process? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, I think that um, I, I, get, I get tickled uh, because it's the, the, the questions are so on point and it's probably one of the things that I'm most proud of is the yeah. fact that I am seen as someone who's approachable and who intentionally goes out and connects with yeah. uh, people in our district. When I first became superintendent of this larger school district, they were like, how do you uh, meet and talk to everybody? And I, I never forget, I went up to a police officer and I shook his hand and I told him, thank you so much for keeping our district safe and um, just appreciate you so much. And this is probably the first week on the job. And this particular police officer had been in the district for, he said, 35 years. And he said, he teared up and he he told me, he goes, I've been here 35 years and not one time has a suit done right. X, Y, or Z. And that's not saying anything about an, another soup. I'm just making the point that uh, people ask, well, how do you do that? You know, you're making it hard for yourself because people have these expectations of you. And what, what about when you don't feel like it? Well, I think that's the advantage of starting in the country. Remember, I told you that I'm from the country. And right. in small schools, you have no choice but to speak to everybody. Right. Otherwise, right. You right. Become the Whether country. you want to or not, it's coming to you. <laughs> and, uh, if you don't take care of them right there, they will go to the local right. um, post office or to the local restaurant right. and they will definitely right. give it to you. So um, I do think it's so important, so important that people not see uh position but they see uh, you know the possibility when they interact with me of w- uh, what's possible for their children and so i really am intentional about that like you said and because the district is so large i do make myself available on social media and uh, i right. get a lot of colleagues they kid me and say oh my gosh you are the social media <laughs> this and you're the social media that but what i've appreciated is uh the number of things that i'm able to be proactive about because people feel like uh, right. and I they know me and they will send it to the inbox. I'm able to send it to my people and we're able to address it. Okay. So, okay. Just, just for, uh, this is a really quick question. Mm-hmm. How many, how many kids in your district? We have uh pre pandemic, we had 67,000 and now we're at about 63. Okay. So, so massive district mm-hmm. comparatively to like, so there's a reason I asked this because when when people look at your position and i'm like i'm making a point right now because i think it's i want people to hear this people are like oh like dad i don't want to be superintendent it's like all political and i guarantee you like there's political stuff you have to deal with and i get it but it's like it's like oh now we can't actually serve people like now we can't connect and you're in this massive school district 
And I guarantee you the reason that you actually have been, you know, winning awards and all this other stuff. And I know you're not like going out and like filling out applications every single week. It's because you've actually made a, like a, a, an effort to connect on a human level and you're recognized for that. And the thing that really bothers me is people say like, I don't want to be a superintendent because I don't want to do all that political stuff. And I like kids and I'm like, yeah, so do I like, I, you know, but you can create that you can be that because you're, you're the superintendent, you're kind of the boss, right? So you can kind of do whatever you want now. Right. And so I, like, I love that because you, you, you have made the job what you want it to be. You didn't just fill a role that you might've saw in the past. Right. And I'm sure you've had good superintendents too and learn from them, but there's probably things that you saw in the past. You're like, nah, I'm not doing that kind of part. Right? <laughs> did, you, did you ever learn from that too? Or oh, absolutely. And I think too, that um, people have to do what they feel comfortable doing, right. but I have to be authentically me. Like literally right. for this podcast, I, um, I didn't sit down and think about questions that you might ask. I didn't, do anything like that because I, I show up best when I'm able to just be authentically right. me. And so anytime I try to be like someone else, and again, I keep referring to Jill because we've had this conversation. I love her style. And yeah. she says that she loves my style and our styles yeah. are very different. And um, so I think we have to be authentically who we are because I think people can, they can sniff out in authenticity. Totally. And so, <laughs> and so um, I also, again, I recognize the importance of the work, not the importance of the position. And so uh, when we're able to celebrate the work, when we're able to assure parents that their students are going to graduate with choices and opportunities because we're working hard to manifest the, our vision, I think that resonates with our, our parents and it resonates with our community because they want to they want an educated uh, workforce to, to graduate from our schools and to you know be productive members of the community. And so I try to uh, make myself available. Now it's hard work. It is hard. Right, because right. I, there, I have, there are expectations of me that um, other soups aren't expected to do, but people expect it from me because I've trained them <laughs> to right. kind of expect it. I, and I, right. I love people too, so that makes it easier. Yeah. It's so, okay. So this is, so I told you, I talked to Jill yesterday, right? And she's on the podcast and she, we talked about the importance of authenticity, like mm -hmm. literally yesterday. So it's, it's fascinating that you're saying this. <laughs> and I, and I, and I actually shared this with her is that like, I mentor a lot of people that go into speaking. And the mm -hmm. thing that I tell them is like, don't try to be me. Don't try to be someone else. Mm -hmm. Like be, because people will read that immediately. Mm -hmm. And like, be you, but louder. That's, that's when you're on a stage, just be you louder, right? Like just that, that's kind of how you are, but don't try to like mimic something. And I've seen so many people totally like give up their personalities and then just go to this certain thing that they should be. And, and it's just like, even if they think it's the right thing or a good thing, people read through it and they're like, it feels fake. And it just kind of like wrecks things. Right. So I like, I, it's amazing that you said, oh, we have so much common and we just talked about exactly the same thing. <laughs> Um, this, so like kind of keeping on this notion of being mm -hmm. authentic, um, obviously, and like, you know, like every educator in the world, um, there's probably you like, you know, you're like, let's move on from 2021. Right. So like, <laughs> so what, like, how do you deal with when you're struggling as a superintendent and you're the, the leader, mm -hmm. do you see that? Like, I think a lot of people see that as like, oh, I've like, I, you can't show weakness here because if I show it, but like, how do you deal with that? Like, how do you portray that? But also instill confidence in people while you're moving forward. Cause there's, you know, there's gotta be like a balance there too. Right. Cause like, if you're like, oh my God, everything's going wrong. Then it's probably not like <laughs> probably not the best thing to do, but you know, I'm sure we felt that like you, we feel that in that process. So how do you deal with that? You know, kind of balancing where people feel confident in you mm -hmm. while you're, you're authentic in, in, in the struggles that you're dealing with. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a really good question as well. Cause you, when you think about it, it would have been easy uh, throughout these couple of, years. I mean, it's been anything but easy. And I think I speak for yeah. everyone when I say I'm sick of COVID. But at the beginning, uh, we set up some beliefs that we have stuck to. You know, one was we were going to go as fast as we can, but as slow as we must. Yeah. And whether that was transitioning back to school or that was uh, pivoting after um, a situation, whatever it was, we stuck to it. And then the other one was we were going to prioritize safety without sacrificing learning. When you right. look at our district and you look at our demographics, and I'm going to share those because 
I think it's important, but our demographics are not who we are. Uh, but we are nearly nine out of 10 of our students are on free or reduced lunch. Mm -hmm. So their school experience matters, regardless of whether right. it's COVID, whether it's hurricane, whatever it is, their right. school experience matters. And then in addition, uh, we're majority black and brown. So 73% of our students are Hispanic and 23% are African-American. So education matters. And so while we were very understanding and we had all kinds of opportunities for our staff to engage and we tried our best to, to be uh, cognizant of the challenges they were facing and um, we moved very slow, we could not, um, we could not ignore the harsh reality that we are mm -hmm. still responsible for educating kids. So while our schools take care of a lot of our social issues, our major responsibility is making sure kids are educated and it's not educate when all is going well. So we've got to continue to do that, do it even when things aren't going well. So I think to answer your question, um, it was one of those things that we I just continue to sell the problem even to our, our while understanding that our teachers, our staff, and everyone was experiencing um, the, the the different challenges that were presented by the pandemic, but also mm -hmm. recognizing that we're getting paid, that we're obligated yeah. uh, to, to continue to educate students. I actually, so I wrote down, this is gonna, so like, I don't know the titles of these podcasts until, <laughs> so I'm like, fast as we can, slow as we must. <laughs> is, is that the correct saying? Uh, we're, as fast as we can, as slow as we must. You say that to anybody at all, day. If you say we're going to go as fast as we can, they're going to respond, but as slow as we must. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the title. I love that title. That's a that's a good title for other things. I'm just Listen, saying. I'm telling you, you uh, you just said that you mentor people too, so I need a mentor. So that is, and I'm good at. I, I'm I'm trying to show others who are in leadership positions the importance of having a mentor because, in addition to you said that. Uh, being a superintendent is a lonely position, and you're right. Yeah. Uh, but through this COVID experience and even before, there's power in your network, and so it's so important that we uh, continue to uh, reach out to people who are in similar uh, positions and yep. facing similar challenges. But it's also important to to reach out to others and and see how you can get better and get stronger. So I'm glad that we're connected now. Yeah, me too. I, <laughs> I, I'm, I like I said, it's a great <laughs> title for stuff. <laughs> Throwing that out there that, that like, you know, I, I, like, I really think about, um, you know, a, a lot of stuff that we're dealing with at the end of the day, if we like, I always, you know, obviously my work is tied to innovation and something I've really been focused on. And a lot of people, when they hear this, they, they, they think like, uh, this guy is like against like reading and write. I'm like, what are you talking about? And like, and, and, you know, like you actually mentioned uh, in our other podcast about spelling tests, right? And I'm I'm like, I'm like maybe a little too pro. I'm pretty pro spelling tests. Like I like spelling <laughs> tests, right? And so people think, like, no. I like, you need a tootsie roll. Miss Bradford gave me tootsie rolls. <laughs> yeah. like, you know, and some people are like, oh, Yo, you're probably just like, oh, you know, it'll auto correct. I'm like, no, I want, I want to know. Like it, it hurts me whenever I, I do Grammarly when I blog and it like shows you things that you've like made mistakes on and it just it just kills me every time. Like I want it to be, you know, to, to be a good writer. But when we talk about innovation, it's about like, there is a foundational element that we have to teach kids like these basic skills, but we're not limiting them to that. Yeah. It's like you teach them these basic elements of, of education. You know, we want kids to be able to read and write. We want kids to be able to do their time tables, but we just don't want it to limit to that. We want to go beyond that. And so I, like, I, I really like, I, I appreciate, um, you know, that you're saying that because I think it's kind of a, a disconnect a lot of times when we look at these really innovative school districts and they're like, Oh, they're not even worried about the basics. I'm like, no, they're grounding thing in the basics, grounding. but they're, but they're going uh, further mm -hmm. beyond. Mm -hmm. So as you, as you look at, as you look at to, you know, this is a very first podcast. So basically there's a ton of pressure because you're setting the tone for the whole year. <laughs> no. Right. So as fast as we can, as slow as we must, right? For the entire everyone that's listening to this. Mm -hmm. So, like as you're looking at 2022 in, in the coming year, um, like what's something that you are, you know, hoping to achieve or you know, in your district, or you're looking forward to, or like even advice that you give to people as we enter this new year? No, I'm I'm really excited to uh number one, um from Texas. So we started the school year 100% in school, which was mm -hmm. so good for us because last year we only had about 44% of our students who were face-to-face. -face. So we will finish this entire year 
uh, face to face. So I'm excited about some of the the work we're doing uh, as far as making sure our students, uh, we want to be the best choice for the students that we serve. And so we continue to um, open up different schools. We opened up the Young Women's Leadership Academy, and I'm telling you, it's phenomenal with a, with a STEM focus and super excited about that work. In addition, we opened up uh, uh, Newcomers uh, Academy for uh, recently recent arrivals to our country. And I'm, I'm telling you, if you ever visit Houston, Texas, you've got to come visit this school. It's called La Promesa. It's a school within a school, but it's for recent arrivals. And I'm telling you, you will leave there just knowing the power of education, just the power of bilingualism. You know, many times we judge someone who it doesn't speak English as if they're <laughs> they're not right. smart. But to see the power of education in um, this uh, school is just powerful. And so as we continue to um, meet the needs of our students, we're grounded in what you said earlier about the foundational skills. And so uh, because our students were out for two years, the, the learning recovery uh, is um, taking place as we speak. And I'm really excited about what that means for our students because they're gonna get the skills that they didn't receive because of the, the pandemic. And so uh, the innovative, and I, you know, I don't use innovation that much. You know that? Yeah. I mean, it's an aside. But everything you're doing, everything you're doing, though, <laughs> is actually innovative, right? It's not not like it's like for me, innovation is about doing new and better things, right? You're like right. looking at solutions. So, but like, I, I think I think we'll that, say that again, though, seriously, because I've, I, yeah. and my, I, I'm, I'm quoted as saying this, and I truly believe, like, innovation and equity. I hate those two words in many ways. Right. And please, please don't take it the wrong way, but I hate sure. them. Because wrong, no. so many people have right. their own interpretations right. of what they mean. And many 100%. times <laughs> it, it doesn't add up. But I like what you just said. Yeah. So so actually, so it's to be honest with you, it's one of my pet. This is literally why I wrote the book, The Innovator's Mindset, because mm -hmm. it's like, oh, we're doing innovative things. We're using this technology and this technology. I'm like, yeah, you're like causing more problems with that. Like you're actually not solving anything. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about innovation, it's just about doing new and better things. Right. Mm -hmm. so when you look at. So that's it. Right. And then what. So. But it's actually interesting because this just happened. Um, so you say like, oh, I'm not, you know, like innovators, innovation is not my thing. But then all the things that you're <laughs> listing, you're like, I'm like, well, those are really innovative <laughs> things that you're doing, right? But you might not connect them with technology or, or whatever. And so part of the reason it, that I wanted to re, like to really define it and talk about it is because you have, I guarantee, teachers in your schools who don't see themselves as innovative, who actually have a kid who's struggling with reading and then they come up with a new way because they none of the stuff they learn in school is working so they're like yeah, i gotta figure out something different because this is not working with these kids so they create it and then and when you define it as something new and better they're like oh i am an innovator and once you start seeing yourself as that way then you start looking for solutions right you start looking this way but i think a lot of people see it as like oh you know i'm I, like i'm not really innovative because i don't use you know twitter <laughs> Twitter is so nice, right. but you're right. Right. <laughs> right. That's how people see it. So like you, like, like I said, you, you've been defining it. The one thing you said, uh, like actually made me think of my mom. So, uh, my mom, my mom, uh, uh, immigrant from Greece to Canada. And, uh, and I'm not gonna lie. Cause this is a, you know, it's a son thing. She would say things like super wrong. Mm -hmm. And we should, like, she'd say Elvis Parsley. Right. We're like who's Elvis Parsley. Right. <laughs> Say like these little things and we like kind of we have like a whole routine of like what she said wrong and she'd say i can speak two languages you can only speak one and you're making fun of me and i was like that's right that's, that's, a, right. Pretty, that's a pretty good point right <laughs> okay so I, I gotta ask you this and i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna use this time to make me better for so i'm really pumped to speak at tas on the mm -hmm. closing keynote there so if i could like if there's something that, I, what would you hope that I talk about there? Or what's something that you hope I convey in that message? Like that would like help um, Texas administrators. Wow, that's a good question. It is, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> that's a, that's a lot question. of pressure. I'm just going to, I'm going to use half my keynote on whatever you said. <laughs> I'm just going to be like, hey, here, here's here's a video from Dr. Goffney. And then, I, and then I'll just do that. No, but I, I do believe uh, that our um educators in Texas and uh, certainly all the ones who will attend uh, your general session is they are phenomenal leaders and have done a yeoman's job of leading through some difficult times. And um, so I think it would be uh, inspirational to share um, just stories or share um, just words to, to continue to encourage because 
people hopefully will get uh, recharged during the, the Christmas break. Mm -hmm. But I know that I go to TASA to get a nugget on how to come back and encourage the people who uh, we have a, another semester. So it, whatever you share, right. uh, give us some nuggets that we can take back to our district so that we can share them with our staff and keep them encouraged, whether it's the, our district leadership teams or our teachers. So anything that you can you can uh, share in regards to, to that, because that's always encouraging. And so I think more than anything, we want to be inspired. Uh, we want to uh, that's yeah. it. That's it. After a pandemic. Well, I mean, but, but I also like the fact that you're going to, I like your definition of innovation because right. we're truly, you would think, oh, people have put innovation aside because it's COVID. But really, <laughs> we've been forced to innovate because of COVID. And so kind of talking through uh, some of some of those different things and then, you know, just highlighting um, some things that, that you've seen across the country that could help hopefully benefit us here in Texas. Okay. So, okay. So I'm going to give you a little sneak peek and you, and it's like, you are, you're it's, so I talk about what's called the core of innovative teaching and learning. It's already mm -hmm. like, they actually sent me, asked me to send. So talk about these four elements. The first one, and it's like, you're nailing all of these. Right? <laughs> so the first one is I say, basically the most important thing we do in education is relationships. If you can't get that right, none of the other stuff matters. Right. Wow. Uh -huh. So like, so we talk about that. Right. And we, like, I'll talk about that. And so you've been talking about like connecting with parents, you know, all this stuff. So there's that. Right. Then I talk about um, master learner, master educator. You talked about and the importance of mentorship, you know, both in and out of the profession. Mm -hmm. So you are modeling yourself as a learner <laughs> first. Uh -huh. Understanding that if I'm a better learner, I'm a better leader. I'm a better teacher. So, mm -hmm. so I don't even have to do this anymore. <laughs> this okay. is so good. Yeah. So the second, the third thing is learner driven evidence and form. So I actually hate the term data driven. I okay. hate it because the, the thing you should be driven is in front of the kids who talk in front. Like, well, I love it. I so love when it. You, when you, and so like people get really like kind of weird about that mm -hmm. because they're like, well, I, be, I say data driven all the time. I'm like, well, don't, it's stupid. Don't say that anymore because. <laughs> Because you're talking about kids, like you're talking about people, and then you're moving backwards from there. And it's not saying don't pay attention to data. It's like, what are you driven by? Right. So, like, you listen, you already have helped me and you haven't even spoken yet. I'm writing that down. Learner driven. You still have to come there, by the way. Because I already mentioned <laughs> you. So, if I'm like, hey, Dr. Goffney, can there. you That's just there. like say hi? And then you're not there. I'll just like, whatever. <laughs> I will be on the front row cheering you on, but right. I'm still in that right. Okay. Now. And so, the, the fourth thing I'll talk about is, and you, if anyone's listening, that's going to be there. You still have to come because I got good stuff. <laughs> It's about how do you empower learners? How do you actually give them voice, right? How do you actually help them lead to like, I'm, I'm not a big fan of we're developing the leaders of tomorrow. I'm like, why are you waiting? Why can't they lead right now? Right? So like, if you if you even just look, and like, I hope that I'll give you some like more ideas, more thoughts and stuff like that. But you are like emulating everything I'm talking about in this too, like without and we didn't set this up like, hey, do this, talk about this stuff. So, so like, it's going to be, yeah, I'm, I'm pumped and, you know, and talk about that, but yeah. And so what's funny is that I call that the core of innovative teaching and learning, right? Mm -hmm. Cause you're focused on doing new and better things, right? Mm -hmm. you, like, Hey, who are the people we serve? And like, we have to open up doors for these kids and, and that's, and like create opportunities that didn't exist for us when we were children. Oh, I love it. Mm -hmm. That's innovation. That's, and I love that too. And so mm -hmm. I like, it, this is awesome. I, I can't wait to um see you there and to to like connect with you and i know you're kind of stuck with me <laughs> right because i'm gonna put it out there there was probably a book coming i am super excited because uh that's certainly one of my my goals so yeah. uh, for 2022 so i'm really looking forward to hearing a goal number one is to hear you at tasa because right. <laughs> no, sure no. you know if you're not there it's gonna be awkward Listen, i'll be like tweeting on the plane i'm like <laughs> Hey, thanks everybody, but <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Goffey didn't show up, so I don't. I will be on the front row. I'm a yeah. TASA officer, so I'm pretty excited and pumped about our TASA conference. And then um, I'm also excited about um, what's possible. I, I truly believe oh, yeah. in in fate, and I'm really excited about um, connecting with you. Well, I, I'm I I I honestly was just so excited about this podcast. I'm so excited to talk to you. I've been like, say I've saved the spot to because I knew. Um, I know that you've been so great at leading people through like a really tough year, right? Or well, what was it like seven years now? I don't even know. What, <laughs> like seven leading what, them, cat years, the dog years. <laughs> I'm just say leading them through the blur because that's yeah. what it basically feels like. I don't even like I still you ask me, I don't know what year it is 
like half the time. I'm like, is it 20? What year is it? Is it 2021? Mm -hmm. Is it or is it twenty? Are we in twenty two? Like I always we're get twenty twenty one, but we're ready for twenty twenty two. Well, maybe it's got to be a little bit better than the last two. Well, we thought right? that for twenty. Don't say it. Do not say that. I think you should. Edit it will that be better. Out. We'll because make it remember, better. Remember, in twenty twenty, we thought twenty twenty one was going to be better. Right. And yeah, so I, do, I know. Every everyone's had that that same response. So, <laughs> I, you know, like we're we're gonna make. I actually we 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 welcome a daughter to the world in twenty twenty. So I'm like, yeah, I had a good twenty twenty. Oh, that is what, what's her daughter's name George, georgia are you serious that was not intentional okay it was not my choice it was not it's not like george jr it's just georgia right so georgia was it after did mom want your name or was it just it no it's just it just we just like the name george is just a good name i don't know why i actually say georgia but that doesn't go no well. we're not doing all that georgia <laughs> <laughs> and so what's okay. her middle name uh, I don't want to say. I don't want to say. It's, it's, okay. I didn't pick it. I didn't pick it. So I'm just not going to say. Oh, you can't do that. I'm not even saying. No. Your daughter, mate, if you don't edit me out, your daughter's going to hear this. I'll tell you. Thing. I'll tell you. This is going to be like a surprise. I'll tell you after the podcast. Okay. So, but think about <laughs> it. The reason why I asked is because you have to say the name mm -hmm. and then see what it sounds like. Like Georgia Kuros. Kuros. Am I pronouncing yeah. it? Oh, right? yeah. It's Georgia Kuros. Yeah. Like it's Georgia you know, Kuros. Sounds like an author. Sounds like a doctor, Dr. Oh, Georgia yeah. Kuros. Sounds yeah. like a lawyer. Sounds like an entrepreneur. You, a YouTuber. A YouTuber. A power name. <laughs> a YouTuber. That's the thing. Maybe. Who knows what it is? But yeah, I, I know. I know. Like this is super hard to get you on the podcast because you have a million. And for the you to take the time has like totally that made my day. Fun. And I know you're like running off to like, you know, do superintendent things right <laughs> after. And so I just everyone that's listening. This is the last thing I'll say to you. And if you can give some final words, mm -hmm. the thing that, you know, I really was emphasized for me in talking to you is that you can be in leadership positions and be, fo and if you focus on people, you'll always excel. <laughs> that, that's, that to me, like, that's all you, your forefront. And you just embodied that in the way that you connected the stories that you shared. And I just can't wait to learn more from you over the, you know, upcoming years. Uh, over the upcoming blur when we get out of <laughs> you know, this upcoming blur, upcoming years. Well, I think yeah, you're yeah, yeah. into existence. I'm so glad we're connected and just looking forward to uh what you share with um no pressure, but there are what I think we're at six thousand oh, whatever. <laughs> and so um just really excited because I know um you're gonna be exactly what we need. It's been a tough couple of years, but yeah. you know that educators are tough people and you were a former educator and now you inspire and um we're really looking forward to our time together yeah well, my, my timing will be off because i'm used to zoom sessions so the, <laughs> so i'm the only one who laughs at my joke i'll be like oh someone's laughing i don't know what to do right now <laughs> hey but thanks everyone for listening uh make sure you connect with dr goffney on twitter and uh and connect and and like she'll get back to you i don't know where you find this time so uh, anyways thanks for everyone for listening i hope you have a wonderful day Thank you.